It's interesting you talk about being traitorous to your Scottish roots because I've always thought that the Scottish accent was the hardest to lose. I met a woman the other day who had the thickest Glaswegian accent mm. and I thought, well, she must have been here for a year or two and she's been here for 50 years. Mm, so yes. did you unlearn it? Um, well, when I, I'm, you, you do realise that I'm in my late 60s, so I go back a long way. And when I was a young student uh, learning about theatre, I was told in no uncertain terms that there was no point in my having any kind of regional accent um, and that whatever traces of Scots there was still left there, uh, not much by the time I went to drama school because I'd done my national service in a radio station, a forces broadcasting service. In Libya? In Libya. And I was sitting on the same side of the microphone that you and I are sitting on, mm. doing very much your kind of job, if I may be so bold as to say so. And, pr and being uh, but, a BBC but using, voice. But using a, a tape recorder a lot of the time, so that constantly my, my vowel sounds were corrected by my chief announcer, my boss, uh, uh, and by the time I'd finished my national service as an announcer and gone back to Scotland, I had no Scots accent to speak of at all. Mm. The only problem was that I'd been mixing with army types. So I went back talking rather like that, you know, mm. talking mm. like somebody like Montgomery. You know, <laughs> yeah. Whom you subsequently uh, played, I think. When I played eventually, yes. <laughs> got it out of my system. But I remember my very first day at Glasgow Drama School, the voice... Uh, instructor said to me, right, that's the end class, but Richardson, would you stay behind? And full of ego, I thought, ah, he's going to tell me I needn't bother going to the voice lesson. <laughs> and when everybody had gone, he said, now then, Richardson, what are we going to do about that accent? And I said, what accent? What are you talking about? And he said, that accent. <laughs> so I had to do exercise, exercises like rolling home to Rio, which I had to say <laughs> like that, rather yeah. than rolling home to Bear. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Can you do a Scots accent now? Can Hardly you? at all. I had a terrible time uh, when I was doing a thing called Murder Rooms, where I played Professor Joseph Bell, who was the inspiration for Gosh. Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes. I asked for a Glaswegian makeup lady to be engaged specially, and I used to go into her caravan or her makeup bus thing in the morning, and I'd say, "Right, Meg, talk to me." Hmm. Particularly after weekends, when I'd been away at home talking to my wife and speaking to her as I'm speaking to you and your listeners now. Mm. And, and I had to get back to talking like that again. And it just took a little while, you know. It, it must do that. Mm. You also did a voice... I remember when you were in the Mountbatten film, you played Nehru, yes, didn't you? Yes, What about the preparation for that? Oh, because oh, I, I sat and listened and viewed... Uh, Endless hours of uh, documentary footage. Because didn't Nehru go to Harrow? Yes, and I'll tell you something rather interesting. Nehru, when uh, it looked quite obvious that independence was on its way, and equally obvious that Nehru was going to be the first Prime Minister of independent India, Mahatma Gandhi said to him, if you are going to be India's Prime Minister, it's about time you dropped that English accent and got a little bit more Hindu into your voice. Because Nehru's accent was as English as mine probably sounds now. So the thing that he did eventually was something that he cultivated very, very carefully later on in his... Uh, uh, so that when he made his broadcasts, you know, like long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny... It, he cultivated that accent, and so did you, by uh, well, golly, yes, didn't I, you? I had to. I had to sound like it. Is it hard to do? I mean, I just, I just admire so much. I, the I just ability. soaked myself into it. Um, when you listen, do you analyse every word? The no, you... no. I think that would be kind of. Uh, that would be kind of constipating, if you pardon the expression. You know how we all, we all do that sort of um, Peter Sellers-y Indian uh, thing. Yes. But you see, what the thing is, Margaret. Forgive me. May I call you Margaret? Um, the, the thing is, people say the Peter Sellers Indian accent, although they say it as though it's something derogatory. In actual fact, it Peter just, Sellers' mm. accent was precise and accurate in every respect. Mm. They said that about my Nero. I, I, I think it was the London Times said Ian Richardson does a Peter Sellers on Pandit Nero. And it was meant as a scathing comment, but in actual fact, it was the, the greatest compliment, compliment I could possibly have achieved. Yeah. I've listened to Indian accents and tried to do them myself, and I've wondered whether there isn't 
one of the elements of it is that there's not much breath in the actual words. They sort of do, it, it becomes an un, an unbreathy sort of thing. Is that at best, part that's of a very it? very astute and clever observation on your part? Well, that's that's the beginning. I wish I still wish I could do accents. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was actually talking about accents. I was having a discussion with friends the other day about the Australian accent because I've been in this place for an awfully long time, and when I started we announcers were expected to sound like carbon copies of BBC announcers. And mm. if I listen to early tapes of myself, I sound awful Well, to my ears now because gradually the, the broader Australian accent has become acceptable. And in the days when I started, your accent defined where you came from and what you did for a living practically. It was a very class mm -hmm. sort of thing in the 50s and 60s. Then now you can hear a high court judge with a broad Australian accent. Are regional accents in Britain now acceptable? Yes, not only acceptable, but across the board preferable to my accent. Um, if you listen to uh, Today in Parliament, <laughs> the predominant accent throughout the parliamentary debates is Scots. Is that so? <laughs> Including the speaker, who speaks like that, order, order. <laughs> comes from the Gorbals. I wonder if I he looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very unfashionable to sound like me. Is it? Yeah, yes, 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 absolutely. What I went to get my honorary doctorate from my old college in Glasgow, and I met the young students afterwards, and they were all talking like this. And I said, don't, don't... Your mouth changes shape when you I do know, that. Well, you know? see, if you think of Glasgow, the Glasgow accent, in order to do it, you have to have a slack mouth. If you want to do an Edinburgh accent, you have to have a tight mouth because it's all very brittle like that. <laughs> but the Glasgow <laughs> one is all slurry and boring. <laughs> anyway, I was speaking to these young students who were enchanting, and I was saying, um, do you do English accent? Oh, no, we would never do an English accent. No, we're Scots, aren't we? We're Scots, you know. Yeah. 